puts the lotion on the podcast or it gets the hose again. And that podcast is... Trapped Under Plastic. The podcast people that watch podcasts instead of just listening to them like normal people. <laughs> is that true? I mean, that is true. We definitely get more views on the tubes than we do in the uh, in the, the downloads, the Me- buzzsprouts. Maybe the buzz sprouts and the, the weed feeds and the <laughs> <laughs> weed feeds. <laughs> uh, I don't know sprouts, weeds. Anyway, I see. I think a part of that has to do with the 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 topic of our podcast, which is mini painting. So maybe more people have it on in the screen. Yeah. And while they're mini painting, maybe we're that's also why. both YouTubers. So a lot, lot, lot portion of our audience are people who are into the visual medium. Yeah, I think you're you're probably right there. Also, we're we're digging pretty deep into a random uh, uh, person's funny uh, comment section, YouTube section. Yes, thingy. we. we I you know we were we were running a little dry on um, people submitting the podcast known as no so, longer <laughs> yeah so then the last episode we called that out and then y'all came in in spades so we got some good ones there that we got the well is now deep again it is so. john how you doing i'm doing pretty well yeah welcome to our bi-weekly hobby chat john and i do not ch- talk talk for the entire 14 days and then he shows up we talk for like four hours about yeah. hobby yeah, I, do you think that is this a chicken and the egg situation? Is is it we don't talk as much because we we feel that our cups runneth over here? <laughs> or I love the biblical language. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been listening, uh, dude. My my sometimes uh, watch alien stuff stuff is. is like, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that, dude. It, Someone made a shirt, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, need that. we need to make that shirt. Um, and uh, so that's if that cup is also floweth over into other, like, into other cups, weird cupeth. theological areas, because, you know, it's not that far of a stretch from the alien stuff to the greater creator stuff mm. and then the greater creators could be aliens mm. is god an alien all right okay this is now a uh, conspiracy theory podcast slash religious no we're not doing that yeah uh out of the preamble <laughs> ramble uh so i played a new game called dice throne you ever heard of dice throne no but those are two awesome words that sound better together yeah, dude it is like dice rolling and card playing the game it's like yahtzee souped up that makes, makes it sound really lame, but it's pretty cool. Makes me want to build an actual dice throne. Okay, there you go. How many dice? I mean, how's that for a YouTube video? How many dice does it take to build a throne? There you go. That's a lot of fucking super glue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's a really good game. People recommended it to me because they're like, Scott, you want to make a dueling game? Check this game out. It does dueling. Um, basically, you pick, you pick a character. There are many characters. There are, I think, currently three seasons, and in each season there are eight different characters you can play as. There's, like, Pyromancer, Barbarian, Moon Elf, like, Cursed Pirate, like, all these. Like, there's an assassin with, like, there's a ninja and a shadowy thief. Wow, dude. Um, and they all have their own boards mm-hmm. with all their own abilities. And basically the main, the heart of the game is you take five dice and you roll them, and the dice have symbols and numbers on them, and they're D6. And you're looking for either straights, like large or small straights. You're looking for a combination of symbols that match an ability on your board to inflict damage or some kind of status effect or positive effects on yourself. Okay. Uh, And it's pretty cool. And you get to reroll those five dice up to two more times, so three total rolls. And you can, like, keep some and reroll others looking for certain combos. Um, You can play cards to modify the dice. You can play cards to, like, upgrade your abilities and all this stuff. And every character feels super individualistic and, like, a lot of fun to play. And, of course, I play the vampire. Um, And, you know, she's got vampire abilities. Uh, It's it's, it's, it's a fun game. I had a lot of fun with it, and all my friends want to play it more. So, 10 out of 10. Those kinds of games where they take uh, the foundation of a very traditional, very tried and true, very, like, enjoyable game like a Yahtzee. And you just like inject it with fantasy steroids. Oh, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, it's like those games. I've played a couple. Um, Chip Theory Games is a company out of Minnesota, actually, um, that they have a couple like um, Too Many Bones is one that we've played that is that kind of a thing. And it uses poker chips and it like it's based off of like more traditional gaming. And then it just works so well. Mm. 
Um, it does the same kind of thing with the boards of different classes or characters. Interesting that the, that game, the one you're discussing, uh, Bone Throne or Dice Throne. Bone Throne! <laughs> Here goes John, making up names for things that stick around forever. <laughs> so when you play Bone Throne, that you can choose a character that is, I hate this it's guy. like old school D&D where it's like a race of people is 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 a character cuz like an old school D&D elf and dwarf um were classes yeah yeah as well as races so it's like sure, i'm playing sure. an elf it's like man why you got to why you got to say all elves are the same <laughs> it can't be like an elf cleric or an elf wizard or an elf fighter it's like no you're just elf nope yeah so when you said like moon elf or vampire like why why all vampires got to be the same yo i don't know they gave they gave special special titles to some ones and not to others sadly where's my like bloodthirsty vampire or like or nightly vampire i would take that too but yeah, it's a good game. I, I hate Yahtzee. Let me be clear about this. <laughs> Let's be it's perfect. not a good game. Uh, well, whatever. It's a fine game, but I don't like it. Um, but this game I do like. So I didn't mean to compare it to Yahtzee and scare people away because of that. It has a lot of mechanics in the game that allow you to affect your dice rolls. That you're pretty much guaranteed to get something on every turn unless you like really push your luck and go for something and just end up with nothing. That that, that rarely happens, which is a it's a good feeling. It, Yahtzee is one of those games that is like 90% luck and 10% how uh, much of a gambler you are, mm -hmm. right? It is purely like, well, what is the risk assessment on this situation and how risk averse am I as a player? It's like those are the questions that you ask. Otherwise, you're just kind of like going around the table and, you know, put the dice in the cup. I like I like the I like that clinky clinky of dice in a cup. It's right? not. Oh yeah, dude, the shaking up. Yeah. I oh, I forgot. Every character has like an ultimate ability too. Where if you roll five of like your six sided symbol, you just you you pop off and do some insane thing. Like the vampire's ult is called exsanguinate, and it does oh, like wow. big damage. It like applies bleed effects, and it's uh, it's cool. It's cool. It just takes all the blood out of everybody in the room, sucking them dry. <sighs> Also, you get blood. Um, All right, what's what's going on in your life? Oh gosh, you don't need that much food. Are All right, you, are so you about to tell me about intermittent fasting right now? <laughs> no, okay. So as a, as a, <laughs> he laughs because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as a, uh, a type one diabetic for most of my life, I've always had this like, what I have come to realize is this much more weird relationship with food than the average human. Um, it's just kind of the way I have to like ride this line all the time with food. And so only till recently I had this revelation of like how as long as you're eating like nutrient rich food, food that's good for your body that gives what your body needs to survive, like how actually little quantity you need, which made me realize like how much food in today's society, in society, <laughs> I'm cringing right now. <laughs> I fucking hate that word. Um, that we eat, especially in Western culture, I feel um, that is not is for nothing other than the pleasure of eating it. Yeah, and identifying that, I'm not like you know trying to be holier than thou or whatever, because I'm as as guilty as everybody, and I'm like rubbing my hands thinking about eating chicky for lunch or whatever <laughs> we're gonna have. Um, about like, gosh, how much did I eat that is not necessary? Yeah. Um, and I'm just like, it's wild. And you you poop way less because you eat way less. That's that's kind of nice. I mean, less of a dirty butthole. Yeah. You know, you got you got to squirt your butt less. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I, I feel that. I feel that. I think we as humans really associate good feelings and like community and family with food yes so instead of it just being sustenance it's all these other things combined together yeah. so i will like just like eat sometimes just to like like feel happy or right like, or like that is like a that, like snacking at night is part of a complete day to me you right know? it's like its own fourth meal yeah um so yeah so i totally get that there's this a weird well. emotional attachment we have to food and yeah like us saying that is is not like a revelation to anyone listening right sure, now. Yeah, the goody peepees yeah. understand that. But I think hearing that and and kind of being aware of that was different. I had some kind of in the last couple of weeks this kind of like my own personal experience revelation with it, which was different than hearing and understanding it and nodding my head and being like, yeah, I know you know, sugar is addiction. And I know that, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just sitting and eating fucking handfuls of peanut butter M&Ms while I'm watching TV <laughs> at night is like, I know it's not 
a healthy thing, but I also like it's hard to visualize how like you know actually those fifteen peanut butter M and M's is not nothing, even though it feels like it's nothing, and you didn't need it, and you know I just I feel um like I know I'm an old man now because I'm forty, like I feel like I have m- like more energy and I feel healthier and I feel like. I'm like have more concentration than I did 10 years ago Okay, because of um, making changes in my life the last like two months, three months. So I'm I'm happy for you. Yeah. And I struggle with that a lot. Like I have a, I have bad eating habits for sure. And like, I always try to do better and it's really easy for me to like not eat like during the work day, during the day, and when I'm on vacation, because like I'm separated from my routine. Yeah. Like I, I actually eat way healthier when I'm vacationing than I do when I'm at home. But as soon as I like get home, and as soon as I like, it's like 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Like I just turn into a, this this snack fiend. Oh yeah. It's uh it's terrible. I it, one thing that I found was that helps me the most is like it just not being available. Like yeah. I just can't, I just don't buy it. If I if it's not at home, if it's at home fucking all bets are off baby. <laughs> right? but if it's not at home or i I've, or i'm like okay i know i'm gonna feel this way what's a different thing that i could buy that's a healthier choice so it's in my house and these are the most like fucking boring like soul-sucking conversations to have with yourself in the grocery <laughs> store you're like god damn it but uh, if it's not there, again. yeah but you have a really positive thing going for you that you and amber are like to make food yeah yeah yeah. you know and even if you make something i've found this if i make something at home for a dinner or a lunch on the weekend or whatever that even if it's not the healthiest choice maybe it's i'm barbecuing something that is innately so much better for you is we don't realize in prepackaged foods or even restaurant foods how much cream and how much butter and how much sugar goes into things that's why they taste so good Mm -hmm. it's like the sheer amount of sugar that's in something that you wouldn't think of it having sugar um you just kind of are taking that apart and and also when you make food yourself at home you can make healthier things and they can taste really good Mm -hmm. because something about i don't know if you have this but when i make food myself like the whole process of making the meal is something like it builds your appetite in the the sensory parts and the crafting of a thing gets you more excited and it tastes better mm. because of that process as I've, opposed I've to I never thought about that but maybe maybe that's true if it was uh, the exact same you know chicken salad sandwich and you just ordered at a restaurant and you sat down and you ate it wouldn't be as taste as good to you as if you made it yourself that's weird because i feel like when i eat out the food just tastes better maybe it's because i didn't have to do any work and i don't like to do work but i don't know i I, lately i've been really trying to get away from that feeling where it's like i'm just trying to rush through making the food i really love to eat and because of that i like to cook but i don't necessarily like to cook that makes any (laughs) sense so I, i really lately i've been trying to just like you know now I'm gonna cook for an hour and that's okay. And I just kind of chill and I just go slowly and make sure I do everything right and then it's fine. I have to be like really mindful about enjoying the uh, the cooking process. Otherwise, it just kind of feels like I'm burning an hour and it's not fun. Yeah, I mean, there's that the the how can I how can you maximize your time and not feel like you're using all of it. So this is now uh, Aliens in Health podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, bringing it back to the world of the hobby. This last week, I went to Texas. I visited Waco uh, to visit Black Sight Studios because they invited me down to film a unwrapped-esque, like how models, how laser cut terrain are uh, works, like how it's made. And it was so cool because they walked me through the whole facility and they have this they have a massive warehouse with like two air conditioned offices on either side but like the vast majority of the square footage is this middle warehouse where like laser cutters are giant industrial spray booth like huge sheets of mdf like large piles like like a railway car worth of like mdf sheets so it's so much mdf uh like shelves for packaging shelves for like products uh shelves for all, all this stuff and that huge area is not air conditioned and like they're wearing like pants and like like closed toed boots and they're sweating their asses off in there. And I was too, like running around with a camera and like filming shit. Um, but it was so cool. It was so cool. They gave me a tour and explained all the all the bits and bobs, like what the process is, each step, like why they do each things. And I knew I knew a fair amount about the resin casting of models, 
but there were still things in there that I learned and I learned so much about laser cutting terrain and like what laser cutters need and like all this stuff. And I think it's going to be a really cool, just like how it's made kind of video. Like I love those kinds of videos yeah, and I hope it comes across that way. But I'm like, Amber had the camera and I'm running around like, like kind of kind of shouting over machinery explaining how like these things are working and so there's fun energy to it and they do everything there like they, they sculpt the models they print the masters they do the resin casts they clean them up they package them up and they ship them out like they do everything in that in that building and so it was cool to see it all start to finish oh i got so many comments and questions <laughs> Him okay so in regards to the sound right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i had so i had some solutions to make it not as bad but you typically in you know making videos controlling the sound and minimizing outside sound yeah. is a big thing it is um we're lucky in the hobby stuff where anybody that's making a video on that you typically have control over m much of it right yeah and, and like especially in an environment like this yes yeah. um but there's also a level of like energy and excitement and the you're along for the ride yeah, right the feel of things are happening i'm hoping that comes across that, and that I, sound that sound adds to it kind of yeah if there is no sound in there and it's a big empty echoey place it doesn't feel alive yeah and so that sound it can, can work for you as long as you know like your voice is still clear and louder enough that they're not kind of on the same wavelength right it makes it harder for the, the audience to hear but and that's the main strategy when you're in a situation basically you, you turn your input volume on your mics all the way down and you shout louder than the machines and then suddenly it's since you're like twice as loud as them they all sink down in the mix like way lower and so I, I did that I'll do some noise removal and you'll still hear it but hopefully it'll be reduced but I told all the employees just ignore me do your work I'll be in your space for a little bit, kind of explaining each step of how like how it works. And then I filmed B roll as well of them doing the individual steps. So you can oh, see people sweet. like they, like we ha that's like the big old uh uh I'm I'm losing it right now. Oh spin caster. So like I saw the guys like uh putting the the like the Vulcan molds in, pouring the resin in, turning the thing on and it spins. They take it out, peel the mold out, kinda clip it up to like clean it up a little bit, send it over to QA and so you, you see all the things happening and it's I thought it was pretty cool. Um Okay, so are, are they producing resin models at Black Sight Studios that are all in-house their own products? Or are they a, also a company that does it for other people? At the moment, they're just doing their own stuff. Okay. And they uh, previously, they had their own resin caster. And I would say in the last couple of months, they started doing it in-house. Uh, they got their own... Uh, spin casting device, their own vulcanizer for making uh, rubber molds. And honestly, I was, I was kind of shocked at how good it works um, and how like high high quality their models were for them being like novices so to speak okay next that warehouse how amazing did it smell it i mean like i like laser cut terrain yes, and it, it smells like that everywhere oh my god like, you can't avoid it i fucking love that there's eight there are eight like he called them prosumer laser cutters but these are like big like six foot by six foot machines and they each have names and a lot of them were named after Cheryl? Pacific, Pacific Rim like uh, monsters wow. or not monsters like uh, like mechs. The yeah. first one was called Gypsy Danger, the classic one. Mm. Uh, yeah. Those are sweet ass names for your machines. <laughs> I know, as opposed to Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's funny if there's six of them and five of them have sweet ass Pacific Rim names and the sixth <laughs> one is just Cheryl. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they, have, they have one guy. Uh, I can't remember his name. His name is Travis. He ran all eight machines and made sure they were all like in uptime, like cutting sheets of stuff. Um, and he, he also fixes them too. Cause apparently they break fairly often. Like at least one is down at all times. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of finicky. So he's the, he, he's Mr. Fix it. Oh yeah. He's, he's the, he's the laser cutter wrangler. Yeah. I can fix it. Yeah. He just goes around with his little, his little wreck it Ralph hammer. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. fixes it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that dude must smell amazing all the time. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't need a cologne. He, yeah, he comes guy. home from work, you know, just like old coal miner that stinks like coal mine. He just smells like that sweet, sweet MDF. Exactly. Sweet. Okay. Final question. Comment. Mm. Can you talk about the lasers? Are they look, do they look, lasers. do they look like James Bond lasers? Uh, they're so close to the cutting material that you don't really see them at all. Like they are like within a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch. So all you see is the cutter head moving, and there's like a little bit of combustion by the surface, a little sure. bit, of, a little bit of fire. But one thing I didn't know is that laser cutters need three types of like inputs to work. They need power, obviously, for the laser. They need a coolant to keep the laser cold. 
Uh, and then lastly, they need compressed air because they need to blow debris away from the cutting area. Otherwise, the ash and soot mm. will light on fire. Yeah. That fire will cause smoke. The smoke will get into the mirrors that are in the laser cutter and it will fog it up. And then the laser is just insta dead. Like it'll die yeah. right away, like within seconds. And so, yeah, like a laser like bounces through mirrors to get to the cutting place it's not, it's not it's not like the source is like right there at the cutter it starts somewhere in the back and shoots through and bounces down man there's cool uh this is this is uh, amazing yeah i would that and more in my video coming <laughs> up in i don't know when <laughs> whenever it releases yeah, I, th I think in august it's gonna come out august okay I'm, I'm excited for that this is this is a little bit of a yeah how it's made kind mm -hmm. of uh vibe for me yeah like you know we grew up watching like the behind the scenes for like lord of the rings and all that mm -hmm. shit so it's it's like that vibe for sure okay that's pretty cool all right uh some more stuff from me um finally finally in i can see the light at the end of the tunnel of me getting my tattoo sleeve done Ooh! found it found a, an artist i really vibe well with really happy that's with, cool. with his um uh, with his style and actually have a buddy that's I found out about it by a buddy that's getting work done by this artist and uh, pretty good communication with them so far and he's he's just north of the Twin Cities so it's going to be like an hour and a half drive for me either way but I have a appointment booked and uh, sent him so many so many words and so many pictures um, but uh, so yeah that's exciting it's a little little bit of something that's happened in the last fortnight for me um and then another thing scott i watched the movie yeah i saw you put the northman in there and i'm sad okay because after our last recording i had like the rare came up where i had a night to myself just wanted to chill at home just wanted to just like watch a movie that i was excited for i had no nothing in mind and i sat down and I just started scrolling through and i found that the northman came up and i'm like i I can't not watch it. I respect that. I am no longer angry. I would have done the same thing. And that is such a good movie. <laughs> Isn't it, dude? Like, he has to go on a quest to find his sword, and he has to fight like a barrow knight, like, to get yes. it. And, like, I think his, what's his sword called? Like, Midnight Drinker or something uh, like that? Or I don't like, remember. Night Drinker? Yeah. Yes. It, it's just like, when you step back and you kind of explain the plot out loud, you're like, this is so fucking epic. It's so cool. Yeah. You know, it's like he's a small boy and his his dad, who's the Thane or something, Yeah, you know, the 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 ruler of an area is murdered and you know by his uncle and uh, this isn't really spoilers it is like the beginning of the movie the whole premise of his journey yeah that's the whole thing yeah, yeah and then it is his journey for revenge right yeah, yep and which is just like a good bloody revenge story can be basic and it's very basic story yeah it is and if i oftentimes appreciate a basic story done well rather than one that is added with layers of convolution because the the basic premise doesn't have enough weight mm -hmm. and this just it's the same thing with like lord of the rings it's a basic story it is like it is the journey to do a singular task mm -hmm. and all the things along the way that uh make it not so simplistic yeah. and this is this his same kind of a thing and you just you like you feel the satisfaction as he it does as he's just like you know r multiple times in the movie he's like randomly like shirtless and sweaty with only being lit by this fire that's just off scene and he's just like covered in blood spray and he's just like <laughs> screaming yeah and it's just there's like, a volcano in the background yeah. Yeah. and all this i'm like oh man i'm here for it this is such a such a such a good movie so thank you for putting that back on my radar it's Absolutely. one of those where it's like when it was coming out i'm like oh my god and then it just fell off my brain because i didn't watch it then so yeah yeah robert eggers is he's he's an awesome director and one thing he does in every single one of his movies is he just drops you right into that world and he's like thinking fucking figure it out like, i'm not gonna there's no exposition there's like very little explaining going on it's yep. just like this is how barbarians are and you're just like okay sure I'll, i'm along for the ride <laughs> right and so it's cool i like that it, it, it doesn't like talk down to the viewer at all no and it it tells it gives you enough there's never like the the awkward the character looks towards the camera and explains like and this is how our society is yeah, set up yeah yeah exactly like, nope, none of that no nope, none of that but there's enough along the whole way that like you get it all yeah without having been told so yeah 
All right. I, uh, last thing for me, I, I finished my game tech book while I was in Texas. And uh, I just want to, I want to share like one small thing about like game design that kind of came up to me uh, while I've been reading this book, which is a really good book. You should check it out if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, and there was this, uh, this concept of endowed progress. Um, a player is more likely to want to invest in your game and progress in your game if you feed them bite-sized amounts of progress along the way. So an example of that being like you can earn uh, victory points in Age of Sigmar every single turn for doing these small tasks. And so you can feel that sense of accomplishment and it feels like it's endowed to you, like you, you earned it and it's yours. And so I was trying to think about how does that apply to a dueling game? And I was like, okay, maybe like what if the health pools were very large, like say 50 HP a person, and you would be doing damage every single turn, like significant chunks, maybe like 8 or 12 or 15, even in, in a big swing. And you feel like you're making progress, but the game isn't like ending in like two turns. Yes. Yeah, it's this concept of uh, feeding them small progress uh, throughout the game so they feel engaged. Right. And maybe there is a, a, a reward system in that where it's like you – different characters can get different buffs or different bonuses or whatever. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's like you, you're able to then flip this card when you've knocked your opponent to 50% health or once you've done 15 damage in a round, this now activates. So even if they're like, you know, it's going to have maybe some some healing mechanic or some... Some like you know, rage mechanic where you're going yeah, crazy because right. you're damage. When you've taken so much or when you've healed yourself so much or these things that are like... Yes, there is the value of I'm getting you closer to death, but I've also, right, right. Uh, by doing the thing that is the goal of the game, also makes me a lot cooler things that I can do, and I feel rewarded by mm -hmm. doing that. Now. Yeah, you don't want like a binary result. The guy is alive or he's dead. You want to you want to feel that progress. Yeah. And sometimes just like the the value of doing 15 damage when they have 50 health is good, but then there's can be a a kickback of like, oh gosh, now he healed eight. Now I just feel like I'm making no progress. Well, but if I also unlocked my Reaver Cleaver, <laughs> or whatever, um, that but, Winnie's item, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then uh, uh, then it's, then I feel good. Feels okay, good. yeah, this 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 game, it's just like all coming together. It's yeah. all coming up roses. Yeah. So now I'm on to I'm on to a, a, a new book called The Theory of Fun uh, by Ray, Ray, uh, Raf, Rafe, something with a K. He has a, a name I've never heard before, um, but I don't know if you know what it's about, but it got recommended. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Cool. Yeah. Um, my final thing in the dichotomy of the talking about healthy stuff lately, um, Popeye's Chicken mm. continues to to dangle its, its greasy goodness in front of me. Lo <laughs> That uh, back in like 2020 or 2019 was the first talks of them opening a Popeye's chicken in my town. And uh, it's like ebbed and flowed. It's like, oh, no, that no, one's gone away or no. And I just there's, Not a, yet. there's a recent update that uh, the 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 land that apparently for this restaurant is purchased. And now it's like back on track for starting building. So just when I thought it was gone. Popeyes is back in my life. Yeah, you know, at this rate, maybe before I die, I'll be able to have Popeyes <laughs> in driving distance. You, you only get it when you go to Adepticon on the way back. <laughs> you eat it like once a year. I know, and I think about it fondly in options that we could do for lunch when I'm up here. Mm. You know? Yeah, there isn't a great Popeyes like in this area. We need to go like uh, gotta go to the the, <laughs> the ghetto one. Yeah, yeah, know? the one on uh. What is that? University? On, I think on Rice. Oh, okay. There might be one on University. University is a big rub. Yeah. All right. On to what we have painted. Um, I have a couple things. Um, I finished Neferata. We've talked about Neferata a couple times, but now she's finally on her throne and the base is like 90% done. Um, I added like a bunch of tufts and like mud and, and stuff like that to it. I want to add more because the base is so big it deserves more. One thing I'm really dis uh, kind of disappointed by with the Neferata sculpt is that like, she is looking straight down. Like, even if you look at that model from front on, from like the height of the the beast, like she is just staring straight down into the ground. Like it's it makes sense, right? But it makes for a lame curb appeal. She it's like almost like her head just needs to be tilted up like thirty degrees. Yeah, just a little bit. And maybe that's on maybe maybe I could have done that. And that this is this is where Sub assemblies kind of get you a little bit. It's like you mm -hmm. don't you don't know us until maybe right at the end. And so I should well, even placing her like yeah you you don't even you don't even know this if you have her entirely built and paint her separate because 
you absolutely should. This is one of those models where it's like putting this all together and try to oh paint God. all the little silliness. Yeah, that'd be hard. Um, you don't even realize it until you have it all painted and then all together kind of a thing. Yeah, and that's what happened to me. I, I had no idea until it's all together. But uh, She's done one of the centerpieces of my army. Happy to have that done. I, I doused the whole base in uh, Dirty Down Moss. And I was just so happy with how it turned out. It, it was so fucking good. It was incredible. It, like like you, you joked about in the in the, the live stream, it was like at least four dollars in dirty down product. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that shit is like liquid gold in that bottle. How expensive it is, but yeah. it's like, oh yeah, but it'll look so awesome. So you just got to keep going, dude. Just, yeah, it really worked out. Um, on smaller bases, it would be be more tenable. But uh, yeah, I got to do some more painting. I got to paint that chain around the coffin, the ghost hand coming out of the box. Got a little, little cleanup on mm. there. Maybe some more tufts. Um, and then I paint the base room, and she'll be done. Gosh, yeah, it's the thing about the dirty down products. Why they're magic is that. They create naturally this interesting inconsistency in just putting it down, whether it's the rust or the moss or the verdigree. Like it naturally dries in a way where it's like over here, it's like more vibrant. Over here, it's more dark. And it's just like it's replicating what these things do in in nature. Yeah. In an almost chaotic way that you don't have to like consciously make those decisions and apply it in this exact right, way. Like yeah. It does it naturally. There are lime greens, mid greens. It looks nice and dusty, which that's another thing that's like grass doesn't necessarily look very like, like or moss doesn't look very satin, right? And yeah. so like it's nice that it's super matte. It definitely sells the feel. It, it acts like a wash. It really sinks into all those pits. Like yeah. on the rock, like in the front, it's sunk into all the pits on that rock and it looks like fucking moss. Yeah, it's like that's where moss would grow. Yeah, like, where, yeah. Where it gets less light and more moisture. And the, even the finish of it, uh, we are not sponsored by Dirty Down, but... We do have an affiliate link in the description, so there like, you go. Or so top. So if you want to check it out and buy it off of our recommendation, we both really like it. Yeah, and well, and I think we do get a little kickback from that too. We do. Yeah, we do. So we are kind of sponsored by them. Yeah. Um, but the even the finish. So you said it's very matte, but it's very matte in the parts where it's brightest, and it's less matte in the areas where it is. Um, you know, it's it's not as thick on, or it hasn't settled as much. And I really like how it's like it acts almost in this like reverse shadow where typically if you put like a wash over something, it's darkest down in the recesses. This product acts kind of opposite or down in the, the thickest recess recesses. It is brightest. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. And so it does the same thing with the, with, with all of the, the products. So yeah. and they came out with a new one that I haven't tried yet, which is like a different rust it's like a yellow more yellowy age yeah yellow rust yellow rust i don't know what the deal with that is yeah i mean maybe if someone sends us a bottle we could find out <laughs> <laughs> yeah um okay what you got uh i painted these two little bug boys here bug boys in uh, my most recent video I, I i did a like revisiting your like starting techniques like I revisited just using washes in a way that when we first learn mini painting what most of us learn and also I came to the question of like is that still the way most people learn in the, the day and age of contrast paint and stuff yeah. oh I mean I don't know um but like just doing base coats wash highlights and I feel like you and I are have our pulse on the hobby and how people learn and by creating videos and the content that's out there for people to um, up their mini painting game or just learn it from in the first place. And I feel like washes have kind of been forgotten. It's not talked about as much. It's kind of been overshadowed by slap chop and contrast and zenithal highlight and all these things in you know, motherfuckers act like you forgot about Dre, okay? But <laughs> Dre in this situation is washes. And so I was just like going back to just washes. And I came to the realization that as advertised, as the basic way that, that a product is marketed, I vastly prefer washes to contrast paint and speed paint because of the flexibility that you have with washes that you do not have with a contrast paint. With the contrast paint, you get um, 
zero depth of color. You get a darker red, a mid-tone red, and a lighter red that's in the bottle, right? But you don't get the variance that you can get with a wash because you have extra variables, and that is in the base color that the wash goes over. And those don't need to be this exact same version of red, just a darker and lighter version of it. It can be, well, the base color was a skin tone. And then I added this blue wash over top. Suddenly, that's a way different amount of options or variables of what my final product can look like versus starting with the skin tone and adding a skin wash or a brown wash or a black wash. And then how do I layer back up? Suddenly you have all these variables of depth of color that you don't need to be a painting expert. You don't even need to understand all those things um, to give your models equally vibrant final outcome. I'm kind of talking a little bit about what we what we experimented with and what we what we learned, which we talk more about in the after party for our patrons. But I've got some more depth to talk about there. So the 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 dude with the blue here, this was a one hour paint job. And the dude with the uh, green and rust color is a 30 minute paint job. And just experimenting on painting fast, but two different versions of using washes as a main foundation and a main step in the entire painting process and um, just leaning into what they do well and trying to maximize your final product in a quick amount of time. Yeah. I'm reminded of I kind of the old idea that like when you combine, when you, when you take a tool that combines two purposes together, it often does those two purposes worse than the individual things. It's mm -hmm. like a, it's like a router mod modem combo, right? Mm. So a contrast paint is a base coat wash combo, but like base coating and washing it isn't necessarily better, but it gives you just so much more flexibility. Like you said, you can you can change up the base coat. Like you, you can do a red undercoat with a blue wash, which is not possible with a contrast paint because it, it, it's going to be a red wash on top of a slightly less red surface, yes. right? So by separating the the, uh, the two, you get a little bit uh, greater degree of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I this one's great. I like the blue one. I know, and this one, the big difference is, uh, spoiler, is this one used a lot more dry brushing. Yeah, and this one was just basic layering. Um, one crazy thing that I kind of came, this kind of kind of come to Jesus moment in this process. <laughs> Again, back to aliens and, and God. Um, was I had this really awesome feeling in this. In that when I first started out and was like painting a bunch of skeletons or, or whatever when I was new, um, that I, I used that base wash build back up process. So I had a version in my head from me in my own experience as a newer painter, what this technique is capable of. And then coming back to it now, further on in my painting journey, I sold myself short because I related the capabilities of this process to my own experience in my own skill level at the point in my journey of when I first used it. So in my head, not even consciously, I thought layer wash highlight had a ceiling to how good it could be. Definitely not. But that was based off of when I was first using it. And that ceiling was based off of my skill level, yep. not the level of capabilities of the technique does that make sense absolutely yeah and i think a lot of people fall prey to that because they're always asking those specific questions like about wet blending and about feathering as if like like you graduate from layering into those things and it's like no like yeah. these are tools that you bring along your entire journey forever yeah and those things are what yield better paint results the the techniques yield the better paint results not me yeah. and that is such a like, I just want to shake the baby when people do that, when they're like, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to start NMM now. And now because I'm doing this, this, this means I'm a better painter and this will make me a better painter and this will yield better painted minis. When in reality, none of that's true. You putting in the hours and you pushing yourself and you wanting to improve, no matter what the variable is that you're adding to that, whether that's NMM or anything else, that is what makes you better. It is not the base coat wash highlight that is holding you back. And so that is kind of was the not unintended journey that I went on with this. 
process. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, you can learn to skateboard really well with like a Walmart skateboard. You don't need the nicest thing. And that's not to say that like washes are limiting in any way, but you can do a lot with, uh, with a little in, in all walks of life. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you have a $500 skateboard, if it's your first skateboard, you're still going to struggle with the big, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You know, my, I remember my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle skateboard that was from Walmart. Yeah. And it was like, it struggled because it didn't have that smooth ride and the, the wheels didn't just like, you just, pu- you know, you pushed a wheel and it would just go for a minute and a half. <laughs> You'd do it and it would rotate like two times and it'd stop. <laughs> but if I didn't figure out balance and I didn't figure out how to move correctly on it, like it didn't matter how good the skateboard is. Right. It's yeah. Just, it's just a tool. You still got to learn. Still got to put in the hours. Yep. That's so uh, that's, uh, that's you got some other little duders there. You want to talk about them? It's kind of related to our topic, um, but without explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm doing is I'm converting and making Cabalite warriors. And also I'm, I'm changing up my schemes. I think in, in the past we met, I mentioned like kind of a tactical desert dark Eldar scheme. And so I took some of my yellow Deldar that are 30% <laughs> done or whatever. And I was like, okay, with the model currently here, is there some way that I can transition into a better paint scheme? And so what I did was I took some of those yellow guys and I just straight up applied Army Painter Grim Black and also GW Black Templar as two tests to their yellow armor just to see what that looks like. Because I want to do black and black and khaki as as my two colors. And so I just I didn't like go very far with these models, um, but I, I applied a contrast paint or a speed paint of sorts to the yellow armor. Um, and there's another one that I forgot my desk that I did further. Um, I just wanted to see what it looked like. I was like, okay, can I, can I go from here? And I was like, okay, what if I, what if I flip flop? What, instead of painting the fatigues tan and the armor black, what if I do the fatigues black and the armor, the armor tan? So I do a little inverted oh. thing and that, that from, to me was like, okay, I, I got, I got mm. something here. I'm going to, I'm going to go with this. And then to tie it into the rest of my army. You know, like some dark elder like uh, paint jobs, they'll often have like one of the shoulders or one of the kneecaps is painted like a different color. Yeah, I might paint one of the kneecaps or one of the shoulders yellow, like the old scheme to tie it back into oh. the rest of the army. Um, so then, once I kind of like was like, okay, I have a direction for a paint scheme. It's not fully ironed out yet. I must start making better Cabalite models because honestly, I kind of hate the Cabalite models for a, for two specific reasons that I want to get into in the topic and how it's related to the topic. But I grabbed that Corsair kit. Which is amazing. It's fucking money. Yeah, the Nakamun set is amazing. They have such cool poses. Yes. And so I, 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 I took one of the poses that I liked so much, and I cleaned up all of the Eldar gobbledygook on it. A lot of the, like, uh, they have gems in the Eldar Dark Eldar world, but there's, there's less of them. Mm-hmm. So some of those, some of the symbols, I cleaned them all off, and I started to add segmented armor to their oh, legs. Wow. So I haven't, I haven't cleaned up the last layer yet. Um, with like scraping and sanding, mm-hmm. um, but like it's it's getting there. Uh, it's getting there. Um, and then like I took another one where I took witch legs and I reposed them so that he was kind of like has like this nice stride um, movement to it. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of movement to him. Um, and I haven't finished that one yet. But I picked up the the Corsair kit from Nakamon and I picked up the Cabalite kit from the other Kill Team box, the Cabalite Trueborn kit, which honestly is is kind of sad. Like you know that the kill team box that comes with the Arbites mm. and the Trueborn, yeah, it's it's literally just a Cabalite Warrior sprue with a sprue this big. That's like upgrade options, which whatever. Like every most kill team boxes come with a team that they clearly care more about, right? Um, and that was the one they didn't care about. And there's still cool options in there, and I'm gonna throw some on my Cabalite Warriors. But that's what I'm doing right now. As uh, that's my next video coming out is I'm I am uh, converting and painting and reinterpreting what desert dark Eldar look like in a way that um, I like and that I'm super enthusiastic about. Yeah. That's a, definitely a, a, I don't want to say a heavy lift, but it's definitely a project with more weight to it because you are, you're hinging a bit of your enjoyment and your fun on you crafting something that's truer to what you would have fun with. Right, and that's what you're touching on exactly what the the topic of the video and also kind of what the topic of the today's uh, episode is going to be. Yeah, okay. I, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. I think that 
ups the level of your um, kind of attachment. And some, oftentimes that's what needs to keep you going is your attachment in in the hobbying and the painting side of it. This right? is true. This is true. You, you fall out of love with it. Suddenly those, those models stay gray. Yeah. Cobalt Keep has a new product they're showing off in today's episode. It's a modular paint storage system that's designed to grow with you as your collection grows as well. With five shelves and two side pieces, you can easily click together one unit. And I'll be honest, we were pleasantly surprised by the fit and finish and how these pieces go together. And also, how sturdy they seem. With the shelf assembled, we can now assemble a bench, which is a combination of a right angle piece and a shroud that helps keep your paints organized. Oh, and it's also worth mentioning that the final version of these are going to have a clear shroud piece so you can easily see the color and the label of all your paints. There are covers for Citadel paint pots as well as dropper bottles, but a variety of brands are accommodated by these two size options. What I love is you can easily remove the benches from the paint rack as small portable trays, and you can organize your paint in logical groups so when you need to paint ultramarines, you're always grabbing the ultramarine bench. If you get more paints and need more storage, each side piece has an additional connector so you can expand as your collection needs. The individual units are sized such that they would fit inside of an IKEA Kallax unit, a piece of furniture I'm sure that we're all familiar with as hobbyists and gamers. We really appreciate how intentional this design is, and while there is a fair degree of modularity and DIY potential, Cobalt Keep clearly put a lot of thought into how this tool is going to be used and how it's actually going to help us as hobbyists. If you want to organize your workspace by picking up a couple of units, they're running a Kickstarter campaign. It's live right now, which you can find linked in the description below. A big thanks to Cobalt Keep for sponsoring today's episode. And speaking of that episode, let's get on to the main topic. John, what is best in hobby? <laughs> I, it doesn't have something to do with uh, drinking the blood of your foes and crushing all their models on the table physically with a hammer. And hearing the lamentations of their wives. Yes. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has something to do with feeling a personal connection to your models. Yeah, man. Like, if it's not, like, just you in that model, like, is it even a model, man? Whoa, dude. <laughs> We treaded into an interesting territory. And, you know, we watch aliens sometimes. Like, wait, wait, what was the state we watch aliens? I'll think about aliens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, today's episode is about how one of the one of the things that's most important to us as hobbyists that we realize because of uh, kind of a unique situation that we put ourselves in with sponsorships, but also one that you may experience because of things like uh, commissions and stuff like that. Yeah, if it's not until you've reached a point in your hobby where you're doing something that you have no connection with and you have no excitement for, do you realize how important that connection, that individuality, that bit of you that really is connected to your hobby, how important that factor is? Yeah. So for the longest time in Age of Sigmar, in version one and two, I, I didn't play any games uh, in that in that system. Um, and then suddenly, when Soulblight Gravelord, Grave Lords came out, I played a decent amount of Age of Sigmar, and I bought models. I hadn't bought any models in the range, other than a couple like one-off things, yeah. for a super long time. Because I felt like, okay, the Wood Elf faction is gone and dead, and like Legions of Nagash isn't exactly what I want it to be. Like They didn't really care about vampires for a long time, uh, for undead stuff. They did a lot of like skeletons and zombies and stuff like that. But then finally, when Soul Blight finally came out, I was like, oh, I have a faction that I love and I'm interested in and playing and that I can like kind of put my creative stamp on. So to you, the biggest part was it has a it has a foundation that you care about. It is a faction that you just aesthetically you look at, you connect with whatever that story is. Some people, the the lore, the background is a big part that they connect with. Some it's purely aesthetic. Um, some is, is visioning your own version of it. Um, but it has to have a foundation that you attach to. Yeah. And right? sometimes like you will like things outside of Warhammer and bring that into, uh, mm -hmm. like the game. So I feel like, a, if like a person that likes dwarves, like there is a dwarf faction and like you kind of can relate easier to that faction and you will enjoy it more. And it's same for vampires for me. I like vampires in all like media. And so it's kind of just an easy W, but yeah. I want to, I want to feel like the thing that I'm picking and playing and and like and working on and hobbying on is like, kind of like an extension of like me, my personality, and my creativity. Yeah, what you like, but 
that's not our our big aha moment. Our big aha moment is nothing to do with like finding a base army or faction or squad that you really relate to. It is the next step. And that step is the personalization, is the uniqueness, is the making it your own. There are many rifles in this world, but this one is mine, right? <laughs> yeah. And that is that is I think we have come to the realization, and maybe you have far before us, so many people are smarter than us, that that the the individuality, the there is only one army, there are many stormcast armies, but there is only one that is this one, and that is mine, is the true kind of draw, the true thing that sets this hobby apart and what makes it so unique is that each of us are doing one thing that there's nothing in the world like it. Yeah, yeah. And that feeling of individuality can come from a lot of places like John mentioned, but even if you're the kind of person that like paints like a, an army based on the box art, it's like it's still the army that you put your brushstroke on and you invested your time in, and that's what makes it unique and special to you. And maybe it doesn't like seem like visually different for like a, a bystander, but if, if it's enough to like convince you that it's like your own thing, then that is what drives forward like all the creative juices. It's a, it's a, it's a very internal thing for me. It's not, I don't really care about what other people think about like my army and my choices that I did with it. I, it's all about how I perceive my army and how I made it unique. Yeah. If it's, if you, it, you have to be selfish in this, right? Because you're yeah. the one that's always playing it. Yes. You're the one that's spending all the hours painting it. Right. And so if you want to make a choice that kind of disobeys lore a little bit for the sake of like, you know what? I want to make cowboy wood elves. It's like, fine, fucking do that. Replace all the dryads with cactus dryads. <laughs> Give them cowboy hats and, and spurs and shit and do that. Like, yeah. you can do that. There are no spears. There's only lassos. Yes, <laughs> yes. And like that, if, if it excites you, then fuck everybody else because you're the one that is excited about it. Like if you make, you know, consensions based off of what you want other people to, to like, then you're just like, Oh, you're just going to fall out of love with it or you're just not going to be as connected to it. Um, and I think that oftentimes when we start the hobby, we, we don't, fully realize this or we don't have the skill set yet to customize or to to come up with your own unique color schemes or whatever and it's like you buy that space marine box and you start with ultramarines like a fucking chode and so <laughs> I'm looking at you Rahul Kohli who just loves <laughs> God, come Jesus. on buddy one day one day you'll graduate to not painting them just like the ultramarines and I'm not throwing shade on people that really and this is where he gets in kind of the lore and the history and stuff people that really like the thing for what it is in the universe of the game. Yeah. I, I there is no downplay on that. But one day you'll go from you just you base cut them all the blue, you put on the wash, you do the edge highlight. You'll be like, okay, now what's the story of my army? Mm -hmm. You know, what it, why are they all why do they have rusting as I'm learning how to do little chipping techniques? Mm -hmm. And how is the basing affecting the story of where they are? And how does this affect the unique chapter symbols that I've created for them? Or why does this guy have way more purity seals? And what's his story and all this? And suddenly, you're still painting them in Ultramarine's colors, but you have now made your own story, your own unique army. And the reasons behind these tiny details, these little Easter eggs that you've done in the modeling, in the painting, in the atmosphere that you've created are truly unique to you. And that is the journey you go on in this hobby. And that's why this hobby is different than just playing a video game or playing a game with, with uh, you know, pre-painted models and playing a game where everything's in one box and every version of this game that will ever be played are just in the 48 models that come in this uh, board game or whatever. It is the, the pure, unique um, version of the game that you've created for yourself. Yeah, and that's really important. Like it's in like I find that the more investment you have in the models like the more you care about their outcome as well like mm. because i am spending a ludicrous amount of time uh, converting this corsair into a single cabalite warrior which is again it's that's that's not efficient that's not gonna like i'm not gonna be able to do that for the entire army 
you know, that's kind of, it's okay. Like, like a couple can be different. I can invest time in, in more, not the others, but because I'm investing so much time in this process, like I am really looking forward to the painting mm. and, I, and like kind of taking my time and making it look really nice. And so a little bit more investment also gives you more encouragement to spend more time uh, painting nicely. And it's for free too. Like, I'm not like having to think about that. It's happening naturally. Like I want to really try hard on painting this model, but, uh, so 40k is in a similar boat for me that age sigmar was in for a while there's there's nothing really in the the, the range that screams me um and i have a small little dark eldar force um but there are just things about the army that like, i'm not super enthusiastic about and so instead of waiting for an army to come out that's like perfect like honestly sisters of battle are pretty damn close to perfect for me uh, so, are, so are dark eldar they're both really close so instead of instead of like waiting more and more and more I want to like make Dark Eldar how I like Dark Eldar, and really lean into this desert theme that I came up with. And like, uh, so, the, so the two biggest problems that I have with Dark Eldar that I'm trying to fix, and it's making it making it more fun for me and making my army feel like it's more personal, is I hate, honestly, I, I hate a lot of the helmets. I think the helmets are kind of stupid. The conehead uh, helmets. Yeah, there, there are some that are cool, and I think sprinkled in for v variety, and because also it's an iconic thing for Dark Eldar. I think it's cool. Like if every sergeant had one of the helmets, mm. I would like that. But for the most part, I don't like them so much. And I want to change them out for like the Corsairs have like this gas mask thing, which feels very Dune-ish, very like deserty. Like your Mad Max. Mad Maxy. And so I want like the basic troops to have like that gas mask look or like goggles and shit. And then I want like the the guy, the leader, the Sybarite to have a helmet. That's one thing. That, that, that's an easy fix. Head swaps are great ways to personalize your army, yeah. right? I feel like we're talking about uh, conehead helmets here. I feel like there's a, there's a a lot of shots that are thrown over the bow over a GWHQ um, because so much of the iconography that really stands out in their IP is in helmets. In the Space Marine helmets, like the silhouette, the basic shapes of that, are yeah. very unique but they're so iconic and there are many versions too and like they have like time periods people are very specific about that yeah. Yeah. and i think if you look at a lot of design choices that gw makes you can find a seven degrees of kevin bacon and always lead back to space marines <laughs> and helmets are no exception and i see that doesn't mean that they're all they're all winners and they're all hits but they uh, they they go for that a lot so they go for helmets a lot and in the elves, both in the 40k and Age of Sigmar, I see a lot of misses. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, yeah. But they don't play it safe. No, they really don't hold their punches back at all with elves. Like they're like, I want to put an entire fireplace on this person's head. I'm gonna fucking do it. <laughs> but it's gonna be an elegant one because yeah. he's an elf. It is uh, yeah, it's elegant. It hey, looks crazy. Hey, I hear I hear we're doing elf helmets, so <laughs> hear me out, guys. Hear me out. Hear me out. We're making these new Lumineth Realm Lords. Okay. Okay, what if we put a helmet on top of a helmet? Oh, <laughs> you like helmets so much? <laughs> yeah. We got helmets on helmets, but on top of that second helmet, there's going to be a glorious eagle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I feel that way often about the helmets. That's one issue, very easy to fix. The next much harder issue is for some reason, every single friggin dark eldar cabalite warrior has this dumbass wide legged look at my dick stance <laughs> like they're all standing like this every single one every single one of the in like the five or ten sprue all have this wide leg stance and like dark eldar they, they got they got elf vibes right they're pompous they're they're very holier than thou and they should have that like that smolder, that walk, yeah. you know, like this, this look of, of superiority, like it should feel that way. And there are some that are like that, but I'm, I'm trying to convert like witch legs and using these Corsair legs to like get that cool saunter that I feel like Dark Eldar mm. should have instead of just being like, they all look like they were supposed <laughs> to be mounted on a horse. Yeah, yeah, kind of, <laughs> yeah. And they all have this thing hanging down between their legs, too. And it's, yeah. like, it's like very specific three design elements. It's like leg one, tabard, leg two. And yeah. it's like they're all split out. And it's just like... Equidistant from each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like it's very samey same and it's very forced and it's like if, if the heavy warrior guy has got the big dark lance, if he's doing that pose... I'm game for that. That's cool. Throw it in there in variety, but like not every single dude. So I'm trying to fix that with uh, with this like 
uh, proof of concept. Yeah, I think a bit of that has to do with the age of the models. It seems like in more recent, um, the more recent a sculpt is, and you see this a lot in the Underworlds Warbands, again, the best models a Games Workshop makes, and it's not even particularly close, are the Underworlds <laughs> Warbands. Because each one is like a unique character with an interesting, you, you, we just need to make one little grot, right? I don't need to make a kit that makes 20 different unique grots, but they're all basically the same. We can just make one best version of a grot. And what they do is they are exploring with the technology and the sculpting and the capabilities, the value of posing, the value of action and movement, the value in how the physiology works in a mm -hmm. body. And it makes older sculpts like this with fucking bow-legged stance holding gun thing, it makes them look aged. <laughs> And I, I think you see, we see more of that now because of we see what it can be. And you're just like, oh, I got all these fucking cowboy bow-legged dumb shits that look like they're supposed to be on horses, but there's no horse there. There's no horse there. There's no horse there, but there no should horse. be. And, and part of that then, I think it, it, it feeds this level of us wanting the individuality, the uniqueness, the coolness of our army or our squad more. Um, and so it makes you want to push the boundaries a bit more. I think going back to like you talking about like the, the crafting of a unique Corsair that you are sculpting fucking thigh plates on this son of a bitch. And you're like really making the pose from each individual bit of the model to really give you a final product you're happy for. I think that there you will find in that process, this is my hypothesis, is you will find in that process what are the core elements to that that really make it work and you'll be able to refine a more streamlined, quicker version that maybe won't look as, probably won't look as cool as this one you put all this time in, but will look 85% of the way there spending 40% of the time or less because you have a kind of going through the learning process, you'll identify what really works and you'll be able to find a way to make faster versions of that. That's my hope for you. Yeah. And I, I, I think that will happen. Thank you. Yeah. It's the same thing with painting, right? It's like with my speed painting methodology that I made a video about, it's like, I'm going to paint this model really nicely and I don't care how long it's going to take. I'm just trying to figure out what looks good. Yeah. And then afterwards, then I'll think about how to make this faster. But it's like, if you're thinking about, Oh man, I can't. This is never gonna work for my army. And then, like, you just never give yourself the opportunity to dream and have fun and like figure stuff out and like experiment. Like, I've never sculpted armor plates before, but I was like on the phone with Valbjorn. I was like, what, like, mm -hmm. should I use a mixture of green stuff and milliput? Like, should I, should I worry about like getting a nice surface finish and should I just like polish it up afterwards? And like, how should I get like the radius of the details right so that, like when I come to edge highlight it, it won't like be like this sharp milliput edge you know like all these questions and it's like you would never have learned and figured this stuff out if you didn't just like give yourself the opportunity to spend five hours converting a model you know yeah. it's like yeah it won't work for your main army but you'll learn a lot and maybe you can take some of those pieces pieces that john alluded to and put them into your your actual army and spend less time yeah and i i wanted to uh i want to take a side step here we're gonna, okay. gonna come back in a little bit gonna strafe a little bit yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do some circle strafing here on our target. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, you got to target lock first, and then you can circle strafe around them. <laughs> is, this a, is this the Breath of the Wild reference? Uh, is it any any, any video? Any, yeah, sure, sure. Any modern action video game that does the target lock system. Um, I'm gonna talk about this from a a purely painting perspective for a moment, and step away from the gaming thing, sure. because I found that I've we're all kind of in this soup of really hard pee on that soup. Yeah, you really that. Yeah. A lot of pull what's that P word that plosive. Plosive. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't think of it but I knew you had me there. Yeah. Uh you have my back. So whenever we are finding models to paint, it's not for a game, it's not for could be a Warhammer model, could be a bust, could be a larger scale, could be a 3D printed Patreon, something you want to back. I always kind of like, you don't know it, you know it when you'll see it moment, right? Where it's just like, oh my God, that model's fucking sweet. I love that skeleton dude. I love the way he's holding that sword. I love the angle that he's posed at. Or maybe just like, I love undead things. Or maybe just like, I love dragons. Or like, that's a sweet ass futuristic robot, dude. Mm -hmm. 
we all have this moment where it's like, yep, I want to paint that. And we don't often think about what that is or why we think that. We just like the things we like or we even like, I don't particularly like those things, but that version of that thing I really want to paint. And there's a bit of that that's connected to our individuality. It's it's a part of me that I really enjoy and I want to put my own take on that. And I know I will have enjoyment in painting this subject. And I think there's a connection between that and what we're talking about in the gaming in that we want to kind of express ourselves a bit of our personality, a bit of the things that we enjoy in whether it's in life, whether it's in art, whether it's in our other hobbies, our other interests, and to show that through our own painting. And I think oftentimes we start with that and that is what is our catalyst to open the open up the wet palette and get out our brushes and to to get through to that. But at a certain point in the painting process, we either have to like kind of like get through it and get to the end, or we have to find another way where that passion to it doesn't always see us through. And I think that's where individuality can come in, where it's like, what is my personal take on how I'm going to paint these robes? Or what is my take of what I think will be an exceller, exciting color combination? And and all of those are like your individuality. It is not a following a, a color by number book kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the more we can lean into the excitement of our own take on things and less the pressure we put on ourselves of how it's supposed to be or how I'm supposed to paint this or someone tell me how to do this. I think the more likely are to get through it and learn from it and have fun with it. And so I think there is a connection there of strictly just looking at it from a painting perspective and also looking at it from a gaming, unique army, unique models kind of perspective. Could, yeah. Do you pick up what I'm putting down there at all? Do you see, or do you see it that way, or do you not, or do you think that that's a that's a different? There's a bigger gap there. So, I, so to repeat what I think, what the main heart of your comment is, is that you don't always have a ton of creative juices to get through the painting process, but the fact that your models are your own individual thing will will kind of carry you those last ten yards. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and I think you need you you need the immediate recognition of a model of I like that model I want to paint that model one you need that at the start and then two to see it through you have to be willing to lean into your individuality and less into the mm. quote unquote how it needs to be done that will get you more satisfaction you'll enjoy it more it'll give you momentum into the next model and you'll have more finished painted models that aren't going to ever be perfect because none of us are ever are. But you are going to go through the motions and enjoy the motions, enjoy the journey um, from the start of this appeals to me to the end of there's a bit of me in this that oh, was yeah. required. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never I haven't done this in a long time, so I, I can't even remember what it feels like. But like if if you gave me like yeah, you're right, you like a model that gets it in the door, mm -hmm. right? Coming up with a cool paint scheme and applying it, that kind of gets you through the process of painting it. Yep. But if you suddenly told me you have to paint it like the box art, like that would just suck all the fun right out of it. Yeah. And I'd be like, okay, like fine. Like sure, I, th I mean, it's going to look fine at the end and I'll have like a completed army or whatever, a completed unit at the end and that's, that's fine. But that would, that would make the actual painting process itself like it, it would lose, I would say, it's hard to put a number on it, but I would say like at least half the enjoyment that I get to experience. Yeah. I, th I think different different people are you know get different enjoyments in different yeah, ways yeah, yeah. and i think you and i are similar in that if we had to only paint things in the same style in the same color scheme in the same uh step-by-step -step process as what is already shown to us i don't think i would probably be painting miniatures yeah like i that that does not do it for me however I know there are people that are like, this is my dark angel army. I want them to look as close as I am able to 
you know replicate as to what the box looks like because i am enthusiastic about dark angel lore and yes. like that, that's where they find their passion and i kind of did the same thing with my vampires like i didn't that's not it's not a crazy vampire idea they're fucking red like how crazy of a, a color combo with that with vampires is that it's not at all so it's like you don't necessarily need to like have the most creative idea for how to paint something really it's just like that you are like inspired and encouraged about that choice for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Just like if, if, feeling limited in, in any way ever, I guess kind of always sucks the creative juices out of any process. Yeah. And okay. We're going to circle strife back to the left. Okay. And uh, so part of the, the catalyst for today's topic was mm. we had a, we had a, we had a little bit of a, of a conjoining a little of, powwow. of we were both, thinking of a thing or, or there was a certain part of that's going on currently in our hobby that ended up kind of conjoining at this topic mm-hmm. and yours around and maybe it's more things too but dealing with your dell dot right here yeah it's it, I, I, basically the video which hopefully comes out before it is going to be called fixing my biggest problem with 40k and that's and i don't know how i'm going to explain that in a succinct way and it's not 40k's fault it's my fault it's a self-induced problem and that this feeling that I don't have any ownership over any faction in 40k. None of them feel like Scott's 40k army. And I'm so I'm going to make Scott's 40k army right here. I'm going to feel like I have a thing that's mine to hold and to keep. Yeah. And it is it is purely you and because of your taking an existing thing and you are twisting it into the, a little bit you know yeah enough to where it becomes the you that didn't exist ex- in the range before yeah yeah and like it's way easier to do that with vampires because they're already what i like yeah so i don't have to do as much work this is this is a little bit more work yeah it's a little bit more work a little bit a m- little bit more mad max fury road mm-hmm. also i mean i've been watching dune i've watched dune like three times in the last like two months <laughs> i think i need to rewatch it. tonight i get a movie night by myself again talking about oh. and so i've been thinking about what i want to watch and I got the I got the big TV, the big surround system downstairs. Ooh, baby, I love that. So I was like, ah, oh, damn. Every time I come to this, and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just watch a movie I know I love, and it that works too. I, I often go back to. I guess I'm watching Fury Road, baby, because I fucking that love one. that ride. That one rocks. But I have not seen Dune since the theater. I don't know if you're like me, but on the second watching of all those movies i think maybe i said this last week or two weeks ago or whatever um i really enjoyed that movie the northman the green knight on a second and third watch like it was way more enjoyable i have not seen green knight since the first time i think we talked about that a bit too because you're a little bit shocked how weird it is right yeah and you kind of are just trying to like it's like you're uh it's like you're out in the boat okay (laughs) And you're out in the boat in the middle of the lake, and you're you're enjoying the festivities of our, going with our, our, our Independence Day, you know. And you just like ah, everyone's jumping out of the boat, and we're gonna swim around a little bit and come back in. You jump out of the boat with Green Knight, and you realize you know, you're in a seventy foot deep lake. Yeah, and the boat's on fire. Yeah. And in fact, the boat's gone. The boat, <laughs> yeah, you turn around, and the boat's not there anymore. I'm just like I'm gonna watch a sweet ass medieval Arthurian movie. You jump in the lake, and you turn around, the boat's gone. Now I spend the rest of the movie just trying to dog paddle my ass back to shore and not die. Yeah. And that is I just trying to like drink from the fucking water hose that is this movie to try to make my way through it to try to figure it out because it's so fucking weird. Not bad. It's just really weird. weird. Yeah. And now I can be like, oh, I can jump out. Of th- I know I can make my way back to shore. Yeah. So I'm going to enjoy the scenery now. That's another very simple movie. Knight goes on a quest, you know. Every any every one of Arthur's knights of the round table had a big quest they went on. He had his own big quest, right, for the Holy Grail. Yeah. And so they all have they all have quests they go on and he goes on a little quest. He has a little side quest in the middle, a couple side quests actually, and it's just it's good. It's a yeah. good classic story. Yeah. You know, just like Monty Python did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually it makes me I'm so pissed I forgot this that um because we talked about Green Knight last time I was up here. My wife bought at a garage sale this weird old children's book that is The Green Knight. It's okay. called The Green Knight. And it's like a picture book, but all of the the words for it or like the whole story for it is like the old fucking Arthurian words. And there's crazy shit that happens in this book that it looks like a children's book and like you 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 like open halfway through the book and there's just a picture of just like this knight beheading somebody. Oh god. And I want to show it to you cuz it's so like it's this uncanny valley thing of yeah. it's just like what I expect it to be from the cover in this bright green 
or bright red cover and it looks just like this nice little dragon and knight or something on the cover and you yeah. go inside and it's like oh my god this is absolute weird. carnage um, let me know what movie you watch okay it's gonna be a good time all right yeah i'll give you the play by play all right all right um so my half of coming into this conversation uh for today's topic was something i actually originally put in the preamble ramble but i think it it has a, a deeper meaning and connection here i have felt lately that I have been dancing around and not finding my own home for my gaming hobby joy. I don't have a current army that I'm working on. I don't have a game I'm excited to hobby around to play. I, I don't have a thing. <laughs> Did I got my fucking kill balls. Dude, all my balls are gilded. I'm just, I'm just fucking. I'm just fucking with you. And uh, I, I don't have a thing right now that really just like I sit and I'm excited and think about when I'm not hobbying. Yeah, because right? yeah. that's a big part of this conversation, right? It is. Yeah. What are you thinking about? Like, excited. What are, you, what are you working on? What's your list? You yeah, know, what's what's in your head? Yeah. What lives rent free in your brain yeah. when you're not actively hobbying? When you're at work? When you're commuting? When you're exercising? When you're sitting and making dinner? Like, if you don't have a a hobby goblin that's inside of your head that's kind of like, no, if, but if I took the lances instead of the swords, <laughs> yeah. you know, like all those things. And then like makes you think about the unique way that you're building, whether it's list building, whether it's model conversion, whether it's whatever. I don't have that right now. I was, I was towing back and forth with, uh, um, what is the, Slaves to Darkness. Yeah, Sigmar. yeah, that was a thing. I was, I've been looking at stuff for 40K and like looking orcs at orcs. Orcs were a thing orcs. once upon a time. Yeah, I'm still like on the, the. Dude, I want to paint an orc vehicle. I've been yeah. fiending after an orc vehicle, like one of the fucking race car ones, like for a while now. But anyways, you were. They have some good know, ones there. And then back. Know. I mean, I think our paths, just much like our paths cross in the undead in Age of Sigmar, I think our paths um, cross in Mad Max. In 40k, yeah, and, and maybe so, even in Dark Eldar as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like like you are you're the like the the sexy elegant Mad Max. I am like the I just want this like bullshittery vehicle orc. <laughs> yeah, you know, death cycle thing like yeah, that. Yeah, like yeah. that. Like we we diverge there. And I I mean Dark Eldar, especially the knock wound box. Like those elves. Like that's my elves dude, right there. Dude. Also, they one like they all have capes, right? Or a lot of them have capes. And one of the capes is the stitched together skin of the Dark Eldar. I'm like, this is fucking perfect. I was like, ah, I can't wait to use that yeah. bit. I have um, I have that whole. Box. I think I painted one, maybe two things out of it. So nice. if you need more of those models, I got them, bro. If you, if I got you, your backs. Thank you, man. I would love some of those bits if you got them. I've I've learned more in my model hoarding <laughs> wisdom over the years that it's like sometimes you collect a lot of things and you're never going to get to all the things. And if you find a friend that has a passion and is active in doing those things, yeah, just give it up. The best thing you can do is is let them. Let them live on and get paint and get games with with somebody else. Yeah. And that helps you because part of my problem is like I don't have a clear direction. Maybe mm. I keep buying shit. <laughs> <laughs> they keep sending you shit. <laughs> yeah. They send me shit. I buy shit. I get all these ideas and I look in my closet. Dude, of, do you feel that way a lot? Like you have these ideas. I often have these big cool ideas that I'm like, oh, man, that'd be cool to do. <laughs> and, then nothing, and then nothing happens, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think the quantity of ideas means that none of them get executed on. Because then I have to make a decision. And then yeah. I have to commit to it. Because then there's this level of commitment of like, oh, well, then this is all my personal hobby time is now to this. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I often get overwhelmed by like if I'm actually going to complete it, I am. Uh, I have to formulate this fucking beautiful mime meme of meme of like him figuring out the math in his head and it's like all, he's scrolling <laughs> yeah, around. It's all floating all the formulas yeah, i have to have that all figured out before i begin i get that what if what if yeah. it didn't matter if you finished it yeah i know what if you just like worked on like a small thing and you're like i don't know if i'm gonna do this again but i want to do it right now so i'm gonna do it right now yeah, it's like what if i'm just like i just like these cool those cool new orc dudes maybe it's like i'll just i'll just build all the orc dudes so i have them so it's not this extra roadblock in front of me mm -hmm. and then once in a while i'm just gonna paint one dude 
Yeah. And then eventually I'll have a bunch of dudes and then I can play kill team with them. Yeah. And then I could maybe play the combat patrol thousand point version of there you go. And then, and then, and then I build a big murder truck. Yeah. And, you know, with it's a bunch of murder clowns in it. Yeah, dude. dude. Or clowns, dude. dude. Wicked clowns. It's going to be the fucking juggalos and juggalettes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but I do understand this idea where it's like, I want to have this idea for an army. Right. And so if you're like, if, if you don't, and I also, I kind of feel like with you, you like to have clear direction and deadlines and goals for things. You like to execute on those goals in a nice stepped manner. Yeah. Uh, Cause that gives you like a sense of accomplishment and like feeling, you know, feeling good. Yeah. Structure is a, a I, which is weird. I don't know. I just, I swear I'm chaotic evil. So I need to like, but I'm also actually lawful evil. So it's like, I, <laughs> I love the idea of chaos, but truly underneath the skin, I need order. Yeah. You know, I sure. need, I need the order for it to, for it to work. And I think from a hobby side that really comes into a big roadblock for me is understanding the painting side really clearly before I begin. Yeah. And I don't necessarily mean like color scheme. The biggest thing that's that I've realized lately is because I am this like weird amoeba in the you know <laughs> primordial soup of of painting styles. I paint in such a wide variety of styles. So I painted fucking Samurai Bunny, which is way the fuck out here. Yeah. And then I paint this thing. Yeah. And which is this I'm I'm holding up the Tyranid that is box art light, crisp clean GW style. Mm-hmm. And then I'm way over in this fucking grim dark and enamel washes and oil bullshittery. And I'm all over the place. You feel like Bilbo right now, right? Yeah. I mean, I am I am butter spread across too much bread. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I get that. And so here's the thing. The artsy fartsy John loves that variety. Loves that I am not I'm not beholden to any master in in my painting style, yeah. right? I am not Juan Hidalgo that I feel like every time I do a painting video, it has to be uh, the heavy contrast painting video. Right, yeah, right? not pigeonholed. I, I, I feel so free in that. However, because I have this level of like I, whatever way the wind is blowing for me that day, that is the muse and that is the way I'll paint. I do not like the feeling of... Ha- applying that to my stuff for a game. There's no home base, right? Yeah, there's. I, I need to always go back home, right? Yeah. And so I need, my big roadblock is I need that home base of painting style yeah. that I'm going to apply to this bigger project. And this is not me feeling I can't execute on it. This is me feeling on I need to establish that mentally. And then I need to have a certain level of order in me knowing that so every time i pick up a new orc to paint i know my home base and i know where i'm starting from Mm -hmm. um a cool little revelation i've had lately is i've really been enjoying this clean gw style and i really like how it looks on the tabletop like playing a game Mm -hmm. and so i'm excited to explore my version of that clean but unique to John style for an army or, or a war band. Cause I've never done that before. Mm-hmm. They've always been a bit too gritty, a bit too slappy, <laughs> sloppy, <laughs> sloppy with a, a level of uh, refined just at the end kind of a thing. But I was like, I want fucking clean. I want clean boys. Do it. You know? So, so what's it going to be then? I mean, this is the this is the age old question of the on the drive up here today. I was thinking about that. Like, what is that? I know myself, and I know that I really want to do Slaves to Darkness, but I also know that all that fucking chaos trim will be the death of me. <laughs> so I have to be realistic. <laughs> As much as I want to do that, is then I'm all then I'm, my brain goes immediately to hacks. How can I hack that? How can I hack painting that with all that fucking trim in a way? But I know that hacks down that path 
you know, leads nothing but despair because I will find a hack, I'll find a way to do it, I will pull it off, and I will look at the models and I'll know they're not as crisp and clean as I want them to be. You'll be sad, yeah. And I'll be sad. So, oh, hey, what if you just paint the models and you don't care about how much time it takes? I mean, that is that is honestly a pretty good option and I think maybe the way to go. Like I didn't paint my soul blight in a video. You know, I painted them over the course of like I mean years literally, but like I finished the like the big half of the army in like six months or like eight months, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And I'm like really happy with how the army turned out. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be happy with the armies that you painted, but like you you paint the armies that you have painted, you've painted in these very like stressful like time constraints. Time constraints. When constraints are fantastic, constraints really help with creativity and figuring things out and problem solving, and they're very important. They're very important to like hem in a person like John and like myself who was like, what do I want to do? I don't know. I could literally do anything. I could paint in literally any way. So the constraint is actually really helpful. Yeah. Um, but like, what if, you know, one time you just didn't have one or you had less of one? Yeah. I think maybe that is the, the key to it is um, for better or worse, a lot of at this point, all of my hobbying in which um, is... All of my hobbying is tied to videos. 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 And so I think there is a bit of the the hole in my soul that's happening right now and has been for a while is mm -hmm. it is if it's not happening for a video, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't say that to look for any sympathy <laughs> or any. I appreciate that comment like, so much. Yeah. Because I feel that so often. It's like. I get a lot of joy out of just kind of explaining to you guys about how I feel and like in, in like what's going on in my in my life. But I'm not asking for anyone to feel bad for me. Yeah. And you feel a very similar yes. way, right? I, do, I yeah. don't. I every time I paint a model for a video or a unit of models or an army of models, I enjoy doing it. If I didn't enjoy doing it, I wouldn't be painting those models or I wouldn't be making that video or I wouldn't be doing this hobby. But there is this is a there, it's a big line. There is not a, a light switch enjoyment, not enjoyment. Right. And so that enjoyment factor is never at 100 percent. But if I just wanted to like sit and paint for myself with no camera on just the model I wanted to paint the way I wanted to paint it, not for a competition, not for a video, not for social media, just for me for fun. That would be a totally different experience. But then this weirdo content creator brain goes on and he's like, oh, but that would be a pretty sweet video if I did a video that was about that. Yeah, yeah. And then back down the rabbit hole I go. And maybe they can coexist. Maybe it is a story of I'm doing this for me. Right now the camera's on and we're going to go through the story together. But this is the last you're going to see of it and the rest I'm going to do on my own. Yeah. Or you could do like I'm going to paint an army over the course of a quarter of a year. And mm -hmm. I'm make out of the three videos I make every single month, one of them is going to be about like my, my army, and it's not going to be like army part one, army part two. You know, it's like it's a unique topic that's relevant to the part of the army you're painting in the video that is useful for for clickbait and for thumbnailing purposes. But it's still you making progress. Um, you also don't have to. I, I feel like it's way better if you don't explicitly state this is going to be a series. Like yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even even in the first video of you if you did that idea of painting the army. I wouldn't say we're going to make couple more of these videos i would like i feel like i would even say that because one it commits you to the yeah. thing and you feel yeah. like pressure to do it then yeah but two then it's like if people feel like they're missing part one and part two or the imaginary part one and part two they'll, they'll skip future ones as well so i would just like i would just kind of float it in low-key and be like i'm painting an army you guys don't even know it yeah don't even know you didn't even realize it yeah. bam it's on you yeah. i kind of did that in my la latest video where i kit bash the big bug yeah where i was like you know would you guys want to see this painted? Would you, was this a, a series, you know, a two-parter that you'd like to see? Part of why I throw that out there is a little bit like how the sausage is made. Two reasons. One, I mean, push engagement. Yeah, you drive comments. Yeah, yeah, right, drive comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, I get good feedback on that comments. Like, mm -hmm. I understand, you know, like, oh, you know, if not a lot of people are saying that, uh, now I know. Three, if the video, if that first video performed poorly, I am not on the hook to do a follow up. <laughs> Luckily for me, the video did well, and I am actually excited to paint that big fucker because I think it will look way cooler painted than it looks just kitbashed and unpainted. 
And so I, I think maybe there's a little bit I can have learned from that to do something like this. But I, I get the end of the day, if it's not a thing that I'm willing to do with the camera off, I'm not, I shouldn't do it. If I end mm. up doing a video or a couple videos on my hobbying for gaming and how I approach the painting that the goal is to play games with it. Um, if I'm not willing to do that when the camera's off, then I shouldn't force it. And so I need to find something that's true to me like John, the hobbyist, completely separate from John, the YouTuber. And if I can find the thing that excites me for just John, the hobbyist, I think it's going to be better for me in my my own hobby, my own like mental health and enjoyment of what this hobby can do. And for my excitement long term in being engaged in the gaming and the the painting to game side. And I think if that I can figure that out, then I will be able to have a really positive experience. And this ties back into this episode's topic, which is it needs to feel true to me and, and what unique to me and my own spin on it and just enough uniqueness, just enough individuality that it feels solely me, but not so massive that it, it's too large of a project that I feel like I can complete. That's that's kind of where I'm feeling in, in this in this realm right now. Yeah. And it's really good to like identify like what works for you as an individual. Cause I feel like what I'm hearing John say is that like maybe he wouldn't be I mean, I don't know if you're willing to like maybe like do like uh like hardcore conversions as part of like uh, a main staple unit in your army and that's totally fine like i don't know i kind of find like i'm in a sweet spot right now like i brought these models home and hobbied on them at home i was sculpting at, at my house and like it didn't matter to me how long it was taking and so finding what works for you and finding where you find your enjoyment in the hobby and spending time in that area is really important it's like maybe maybe what we're saying isn't like really working for you but like trying something else out and, and finding that that joy it's you kind of find like you, you get in the pocket right it's just like it doesn't matter how long it's taking and you're just having fun and it's, and that's all that yeah. matters. It's like, it's a really special place to be and we should all, we should all search for that, that kind of, that kind of feeling. Yeah. And, and not having, there's something you, you touch on there and you mentioned earlier is like putting the time constraints and having it all figured out before you begin should not be the way that you feel like you need to approach it. Like if you're just like, I want to make a cooler looking Corsair, that is all you need to know. Yeah. Right. Then just dig in. Do not constrain yourself in any form or fashion. You know, if if you are doing that, you goody peepees at home, you are doing that with like, I'm just going to do one model and I just want to see how cool I can make it. Uh, it's going to maybe I'm just going to tweak the head and I'm going to paint it with this totally different head and see what it looks like. Like you don't need to commit to or know the answer to that being your a full unit of those things or a full army or a new faction or whatever. None of that. Just go with it and you'll know. At, at the time you have done it, whether you want to continue or not. Mm -hmm. But for now, we'll just do some milliput sculpting. Yeah. So That's all I'm worried about. So to tie back to this clickbaity title, so you know y'all can not use that word in the in the comment oh, they section will. below. They will. Um, this the the individuality. I stand behind the title. This, your individuality, what makes this hobby unique for you and only you, no other person in the history of time will ever have it the same as you. That is what is most important. Yeah. You know, at least to us, like, like I mentioned before we started the podcast, it is the lifeblood for my hobby. If I stop doing that, I can go on for six months. I can go on for maybe a year, but I will not want to paint ever again. Mm -hmm. Like it, it will kill my enjoyment. And so this, this kind of thing is necessary for me to have fun. Yeah. I think at its at its heart, all levels of creation, art or, you know, woodworking, making your own rocking chair. Like if you do that, that level of creation at its heart, it is creating a thing that's unique that you brought into existence and that no one else has done. And there can be you can make a copy of that. You can do step by step and you can show people how to make the exact same rocking chair but it's not the same rocking chair as yours and so that's kind of what we're doing here it's like yes it's a uh, back to the ultramarines yes it's an ultramarine army and there's ten thousand fully painted ultramarine armies in the world right now 
It's probably more than that. But <laughs> this one is unique to you because your hand made it and it was your story and the way you built your list, the way you wanted to come up with how they are. Um, it's just that that unique aspect of that. And if you take that out of it or if you, you lean away from it, I feel like you are treading in, in dangerous waters. Um, and I mean, I guess there are people that are like, they pay someone to paint their army and they just want to go to tournaments and just want to play. Oh yeah. They're not, they're not listening right now. Yeah. They're, they're not here. Yeah. No, they're not here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not here. You're here. You're here. You can't go. You can't escape. You're, <laughs> I'm not stuck in here with you. You're stuck in here with me. E. Well, I mean, do you feel like we have thoroughly convinced everyone that the most important thing in the hobby is that it is unique to them? Do you think that we convince them? I hope that we convince them that it's the most important to us and for them to consider it. And the most important to them, and their opinion doesn't matter. Yeah, you everything we say about the hobby, you should apply to your own life one-to-one. You and I are the same person. Look me in the eyes. Even though you're an audio listener, look me in the <laughs> listen, look me in the ear eyes. <laughs> Did you say lick me in the ear yeah, eyes? That's what I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, wanna what's it called when someone licks their finger and puts it in your fucking ear? Wet Willy? Wet Willy, dude. You want a virtual wet willy from all the good <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You get so much fucking hiv and <laughs> <laughs> What a classic bamboozle, you know? <laughs> I mean, just stick my moist finger in your fucking ear, dude. You know what's funny is like whenever like if you'd like see that or you think about a wet willy or like, you know, you see it in a show or whatever, you see your friend do it, your other friend in middle school, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny. It's not that like weird. Uh, it's not that odd. You ever get a wet willy? It's the most it's weird fucking thing. And it, it is. is like, it, you feel so violated. Yeah, that's the exact <laughs> word I was going to use when you're done talking. It's such a violation. Yeah. Yeah. So you ever want to like just totally piss off your significant other? Just wet willy of them out of nowhere. And they're going to not like it. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, I should wet willy John like later today. Like when he sits down at like a restaurant, I was like, come behind him and just like, Pop right in, dude. So you better be fucking watching, bro. Yeah, dude. Now that you mentioned that, now I'm gonna be eyes out. Here's on guard, dude. <laughs> yeah, but is yeah, but but if you didn't say that comment right there, and then you just hit me later, I would be like, fuck, how did I not see this comment? <laughs> All right, on to the news. Um, shoot, there was an actual news topic that I had thought of that I forgot. I have I have one that I is an actual news topic because yeah. the news relates to me. I just got an email yesterday from Kingdom Death for the delivery of the Gambler's Chest for me to do the shipping because it is shipping. Gambler's Chest yeah. is the final part. Whatever. Final part of the original um, the Kingdom Death Kickstarter. That this is the final tale that they have not fulfilled on, which is the main reason why there's so much like general shittery talk about kingdom death about they do like have not delivered even to their very first kickstarter which was like i don't know eight ten years old now like this is it's finally happening it's finally shipping and i don't even know what's in it i know that they've done posts and i know that there's been kickstarter updates or whatever the sheer amount of models and what's in this thing is supposed to be massive um and so i'm, I'm pretty excited I, I love painting them little little kingdom deathers do you I like the th- the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I like the I idea. I think at this point I've painted more Acadia models than you. I think I painted probably. Oh wait, no, you've painted some. Yeah, you've yeah, painted. I painted some. all the original survivors. I painted the white line. I painted the butcher. Okay, I painted. I, okay, you win. You win. You win. <laughs> maybe a couple of the one-off ones, and then they just did another release. They just had another like new model thing on their website this week, and I spent like one hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> Uh, cause there's finally some sweet ass models on there. KDM and magic. The gathering are your fucking kryptonite, bro. I know your wallet's kryptonite. I should say. Yeah. My wallet, not me personally, just my money's yeah, your wallet <laughs> has its own brain, you know? And so that, that's, makes some uh, choices. That, that's, that's a newsy news. You got a, you got a different newsy news. Uh, we got a pretty weak news section for you today. I think probably the coolest thing and the, the, the newsiest news that you probably haven't heard yet is that. Hornby, which is a collective that uh, comprises Airfix, Humbrol, and Corgi, has purchased a minority stake in Warlord Games. So approximately a quarter of the company, which is worth $1.62 million, million? million dollars. Uh, but the uh, the management team at Warlord is going to remain the same. But it's just interesting that a, 
a quarter of the company was acquired by a larger company. Investors. Investors. I mean, that's well, that's probably a good thing, right? That means that they the investor sees value in the company and wants to, you know, help invest and see them continue to grow. Cause yeah. they, you don't invest so you don't make money. Yeah. I, ideally, you should make money on investments. I'm not a money man, but uh, I think if you put money in the thing, you want to get money back. That is true. Also, it gets gets uh, Warlord a little bit of liquid cash ready to right. spend on new projects. Yeah, they're going to be fucking pumping out them little army men. Little army men. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like Warlord. Every dude that I've met at a convention that are Warlord Games dudes are always like the nicest people. Yeah. Like, and they're like, like they're knee deep in it. They always like know the know. Like they know the company. They know the things. They're passionate about it. They're also just like you know not random guy. They're part of a some kind of a leadership team or whatever too. So I appreciate that. They let me sit in their little tanks. <laughs> you know they let them, them little jeeps with fifty cals on them. Yeah. They don't let me shoot the fifty cal though. So <laughs> I shot a fifty cal. I saw that picture of you. I was so scared what an experience. for you. <laughs> what an experience. I was just ready for you to be like a like a Roger Rabbit cartoon where you just shoot it and your body goes the yeah. other direction. Yeah. You know, honestly, I thought that was gonna happen too. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Warlord Games, they released a new book called Tough Gut, a sequel to their last campaign book called Soft Underbelly. And this book covers the first five months of the mainland Italian invasion in 1934 and 44 with 10 unique scenarios. That's pretty cool if you're like super into history to like reenact those battles with miniatures. Like obviously that's a that's a very old concept that everyone who is a historical war gamer is familiar with but um, as someone who's not kind of on the sidelines and kind of just watching it happen that'd be very cool to I just saw this, ran his battles. You, you, are you aware of like, like the, I don't want to say canceling but like the politically correct or like the stuff with historical war games about the faux pas around it yeah it's like you know like oh playing as nazis and all this stuff and i get that that's just kind of weird but i also i'm like i also see that people are interested in history and interested in seeing how these events happened and it's like well if you dug into looking at like the history of nazis through your own research or through watching documentaries and all that kind of stuff that doesn't make you a Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer. Something about playing, painting and playing a game as that. I can see where it's like, oh, you feel a little bit more positive connection. But I don't think people do. But it's 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 really interesting. And I, I almost wonder if like chatting with the, the Warlord Games people, is he like, what, are the, what do they think about like that? Yeah. How do they toe that line? Like, how do they reconcile that feeling of like, Wanting to appreciate history for what it is, but being labeled as like a Nazi sympathizer because you're painting and playing as like German soldiers, you know? Right. It's like a, I don't know how like often that happens. Um, and like I know of people that do stray too far into yeah. the appreciation of yeah. like that culture in that time period. Um, so it's like, I don't know. I, that doesn't represent the majority of the hobby for sure, uh, but they probably have to, they, they suffer the costs of those right. minority, right? Right. Um, so it's yeah. kind of like when, when GW did their big statement of like, we don't support people that are like fascists and play 40K or whatever. And it's like, that is not okay and blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, you kind of think like, well, yeah, we make the game. We don't support. Like you could make anything. You could make fucking like baby wipes. And it doesn't mean that like, well, we make the baby wipes. So anybody, if Ted Bundy used baby wipes that like we're associate, you know what I mean? Like it's like. Yeah. At some point, it's like we cr we create a thing. We're not responsible for how it's used. Anyway, this is also a thing of like the like the era of the internet, where it's just like, oh, it's this invisible, scary other in the ether. But me on the internet, I just assume that it, it's like this craziest worst case scenario exists. But but also like you go to your game store, you meet a really nice dude, you can play. You know, well, maybe you play a whatever game with them, and you're like. Oh, this is a regular guy. He's a nice guy. He's an interesting guy. He, you know, he's got four different armies for this bolt action game. That doesn't mean he's a weird. I was like, oh, if you met a real person and find out they're good people, like, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this meado. Not everyone's a weirdo. There are some weirdos, though. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about fucking vampire terrain, Scott. Let's do it. There's a new set for Warcry. And I was confused about this because I was like, wait, I know this this army. And I was like, wait, they already have a Warcry set. Just kidding. They have an Underworld set. Yeah. The, both of these both of these factions in here are 
Underworld's teams that they're repurposing, and it's also in a small box. It's not in a big oh. giant box. See, I didn't get that. I was like, "What's the difference here?" And then I realized, "Oh, it's they 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 made this team available to Warcry, the other fantasy skirmish game that GW makes." So mm-hmm. yeah, the uh, Crimson Court. Yep. And then the uh, what are the other uh, Stormcast models? Some other Stormcast ones. I didn't pay attention. I kind of gloss over them. Like I've <laughs> seen one, I've seen them all. They got it's the one with the the tick got the lantern, right? And there's like oh, oh, is it Lantern Girl? Yeah, it's, I think it's Lantern Girl. Yeah, yeah. And she got like a hood on too. I think. Uh, okay, right. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I don't know if if it's it's not Rock Nido. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. a different one. That's a different one. Okay, but but the the models inside are all refurbished or reused ones but there's new terrain in there there's mm-hmm. new there's i think i don't think all the terrain in it is new but there's definitely some new undead terrain in there and like a big statue thing uh, it's like a vampire statue thing and like a big crazy coffin thing you know all these things are great yeah uh, I mean, I love them too. I, I would love to have those bits to sprinkle into some vampire themed terrain. Yeah, they're little sprinkles on your your uh, vampire uh, Sunday. Sprinkles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mantic, good guy Mantic, uh, came out with a new book uh, called Firefight Command Protocols. And if you ordered that book or a uh, a product that contained that book sometime in 2023, if you email the support line, they will ship you a free copy of that new book. That's pretty fucking cool. That's nice. I'm, I'm very into that. Good, good job, Mantic. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you just do what's right by your customers. Yeah. Uh, GW also announced this is like the, the the typical release rotation now, or after your big launch of the new edition, the new box set, the Leviathan box set. Now they're going to start coming in the back door with these different size box starter sets. Um. So. It's Marines, Gaunt, some paints, some handbooks, whatever, as well as they, they do different sizes. So people like want to get in and what level you want to get in. So it's like, you know, same old, same old. Although I don't know if they've ever done it that have included like hobby supplies with like brushes and paints before. Mm. Maybe they have. And I just one of the bigger boxes. Yeah, I'm not sure. Definitely. They've definitely had starter sets in the past. They were smaller before. It's like a couple one. models, but they're from the factions from the newest box. Or exactly. Whatever. But yeah. 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 Um, I just think that three is a weird number. It is. You know, three shall be the number. <laughs> no more, no less. Yes. Uh, John, what's your thoughts on s- tiny minis, like 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 epic scale models? Oh, yeah, because they showed off that they're doing the epic now. Yeah, Horus, Heresy, Legions, Imperial, Imperials have, like, these new epic scale gaming models. Uh, do, what do you think about tiny models? The only thing that excites me about them right now is thinking about like the stuff that um roman the pot's doing with the shadow boxes right so he has this, this force perspective where there's a foreground and background but if you have those little tiny dudes then you could have the them in the background yeah he's like messing with scale yeah that's cool i think that's that that's what i saw and it kind of was like oh, that would be kind of cool that would be kind of cool for sure but i could give zero fucks about like playing a game with super super tiny dudes yeah I, the one benefit that he's kind of kind of got me interested in playing like a fantasy epic scale game is like they paint up so fast yeah it's like they're so small and so you really don't need to care that much about each individual model it's more like i'm gonna paint this brick of 20 guys all at the same time and like a brick of 20 guys is like painting an individual 32 millimeter high detailed figure uh so that's kind of that's kind of appealing to have like that many to finish that many models that quickly like it feels like it, I've I've only painted one tiny tiny boy. You've painted I think more than me. No, no, I just one, the one vampire. Okay. It feels like to me, yes, you have less to worry about for details because they're so tiny, but like it also feels the step of having black lining is even more important because oh. they're so small. You have to define the colors and the shapes, and that requires a. A level. I'm not saying you, maybe, maybe you probably know. start from darkest color, and you got yeah. little, you got to keep that dark line around. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you're just looking at little blobs. Yeah, because who's gonna be recess shading those figures? I don't know. I haven't painted enough to know like what's possible, but uh, that's the only thing kind of that's just keeping epic scale models in the back of my head. Kind of just like you could have an entire undead army, and you could paint it in two days. No, I, I don't. I do not think it would be faster <laughs> to paint those at all. Like, I don't know what your brain is thinking was wrong. I think the thing, the reason why it wouldn't be faster is because the the scale of the army then goes up, right? And now it's more figures in your army because they are tinier. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're going to be like 7,000 little skeletons. little tiny skeletons. Yeah, yeah, probably. Because there's 600 on a base. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else worth talking about? Uh, no, I think we hit the ones that, that I wanted to talk about and the ones that you wanted to talk about. So that's enough for the newsy news. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for hanging out all the way until the end and supporting us with your ears. If you want to support us with your dollars, there are a couple of ways to do that. Johnny boy, take it away. We, we get your ear support and, and now we get your wallet support. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can whitelist this podcast which is not really a thing you have to worry about if you're listening to us through any podcast locale. But if you're watching us on YouTube and you whitelist us, that means that ads, the ads that are automatically play every 30 minutes will run. And then we get a couple of pennies for every thousand <laughs> views yeah. um, for that. So that's and one. Just to things. further explain that, because that is kind of a weird concept. You can't just do that on YouTube. But a lot of you have ad blockers. I get it. I have an ad blocker on my my browser as well. But channels that I care about, I have an add on for on my on my web browser that I can whitelist channels and watch ads for them. And instead of supporting them on Patreon or buying their merch, that's a way that I can support them so that they earn a little bit of AdSense. Or you can buy our merch, which is you get some Goody PP Destroyer of Tendies uh, mm. shirt, which is the greatest t-shirt in the history of t-shirts i like how the merch for the podcast has organically grown you know like i haven't yes. i haven't given it much thought like we just get designs from people and it's like yeah that's the podcast sure let's throw yeah, it out yeah that's that is one like beautiful thing of the of a i feel like podcasting is like things happen from our discussions more than they organically <laughs> happen from a, making a video. Yeah, yeah. I got like six emails about making a magazine in the last podcast. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I haven't read through them yet, but like I'm got, excited to. I've seen a bunch, too. Yeah, have you? Yes. Nice. Uh, I mean, I was like, I love it. Like, this is the thing is like, I think we've got the potential for so many awesome things, whether it's a, a TV show, whether it's a <laughs> convention, whether it's a magazine. We totally would love and could make awesome things if we could clone ourselves <laughs> eight times. So we, but I mean, Hey, I'm all about trying to find an annual magazine and see if it makes money for the podcast. And we, we, we could just have to like hire someone to do all the heavy lifting <laughs> like yeah. that knows printing that knows makes anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, merch. We got merch. <laughs> <laughs> we got the, the Patreon. So, you know, one, here's the most important thing. We want to give you back something for being a patron because we appreciate that. And so we have a longer version of the podcast that you get where you get the after party, which is a longer extended cut. But more importantly than that is that is you saying you value that this podcast exists. You want to give a couple of bucks a month because it's worth a couple of bucks of value and you want it to continue. So that is the main thing. Um, we want to give back, but if you support there, it is you saying, I appreciate it. And so we appreciate all of our patrons that support us there. Is there anything else? Is there any other things? That yeah. People I mean, if you want to give us like a rating or a review on wherever you listen to podcasts, most of our viewers are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and, St and Google Podcasts. That's where we get most of our views. If you want to give us a little review on there and say why you like the podcast, uh, that's helpful to have us rise up on those platforms and get more visibility. Cool. All right. That's it. We'll be back here two weeks from now, and it's going to be a special episode. Why? Because it's the 100th episode, and we got a little fun thing planned because we actually planned something. Dude, the only thing we're prepared, the only reason why we're prepared for this is because I thought this was the 100th episode. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, James, help us with this crazy thing. And he's like, okay, yeah. And I like, never how much time do I have? And you're, you're like, two days. He's like, shit. And, really, and then Scott's like, oh, by the way, uh, actually, the next episode is 99. So it's the one after. So James and I were both like, oh, James is like, oh, I'm so stressed out. <laughs> I'm like, sweet, James, you got a two week extension. <laughs> um, so that's fun, it. Though. Show up for that one. Yeah. Make sure uh, we'll, you know, we'll give everyone Laffy Taffy and Big Reds. Yes. And we'll have T-shirt cannons and everything. Shh. <laughs> What and a beautiful sound. It's not a fun t-shirt cannon sound. Yeah, dude, do it again. Oh. <laughs> you ever, oh, I, already, I already asked you this question. The question of, do you ever just say foreign words because they sound cool? Yeah, <laughs> but then you have to like do it in their accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, You can't say a French word like an American. No. Then it does not sound cool. No, it does not. All right, anyways, let's get us out of here. Let's get croissants. Croissants. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, okay. So Scott and I are going to go get some chicky chicky buck buck. And uh, so you guys go get yourself some chicky chicky buck buck. And we're going to catch you on the flippity flop. <laughs>